Hello, Rick. Uh, I'm going to be in college. Hello. What are you going to do? I know. Uh, so We'd like to get going if we can. Just tell him. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Sorry. I'm okay. Uh, Alright. Yeah, so recently they introduced the Bachelor. Alright, we'd like to get going, everybody. 610. So first of all, let me welcome everybody. For those of you, because um, I never want to be presumptuous, but my name is Rick Belangiardi, and I have the privilege of serving you as mayor. We're looking forward to tonight. Uh, we've got a, a lot of things we'd like to set up before we begin. Uh, we're going to go for two hours, so we're going to end at 8.10, but most of us stick around afterwards, uh, and I'll get into the ground rules in a little bit. Um, but as we always like to do, we want to start off with a poule, and we have asked Pastor Kylie, I, I, I've got a Kyle alum. I got it right? Okay. Pass along. Let me just adjust this for height. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's good to see all of you here. This is my first town hall meeting that I'm going to be a part of. I'm just going to be like a fly on the wall in the back and kind of watch how things play, play out. But my name is Kyle. I'm a pastor at New Hope Oahu, which is a church over on Sand Island Access Road, and I've uh, been there for quite a few years. Um, I'm also, uh, unbeknownst to many, I am actually a volunteer in the city and county uh, working in the Department of Emergency Management uh, in some of their uh, specialized services. I'm a chaplain there. And uh, 10 years, yeah. But it's so good to see all of you here and to see the staff of the mayor who are here to field your concerns and questions for our neighborhoods, which you love so much. I've been in Kapalama for about 10 years now, living right behind Damien School, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful place, and I'm, I feel privileged and blessed to live here. You know, uh, this morning I was reading in my Bible, and it just so happened to be about Solomon. And many people know about Solomon as being uh, the, one of the richest and, and greatest of human beings, not just a king, but of human beings, not just in the Bible, but historically, there are artifacts that show uh, Solomon's wealth, his, his temple, uh, records of what he had done. And what's really cool about it is that he had all, had all of these, all this wisdom, and he had uh, possessions, and he had power, and he had prestige, and he had wealth. But, but that didn't come by hook or by crook. He didn't earn it. He didn't work for it. God had given it to him. But in a prayer in, in, in the night, in the dark of night, God told Solomon in his young age as a new king, ask me for anything and I'll give it to you. And I'm sure Solomon must have thought about it for a second and said, wow, I could get just about anything I want from God. That's pretty cool. And said, you know, ruling a kingdom is not an easy task. So rather than stuff and rather than possessions, power or property or the heads of my enemies, God, would you give me wisdom? And God said, because you didn't ask for possessions, power, property, or the heads of your enemies, I will give you the wisdom of the ages. And in addition to that came power, prestige, property, possessions, and everything he had ever wanted. And he ruled with peace for pretty much his entire reign. So one of the things I'm going to pray about tonight is just that that wisdom would prevail. So would you go ahead and bow your heads with me as I just take a few minutes to pray. Um, Lord Jesus, in the same manner, uh, if you could give us what we wanted here in, this, in our neighborhoods, the neighborhoods we love so much, Kalihi and Palama and uh, Kaka'ako and Nu'uanu, Pau'oa, downtown, Chinatown, we could ask for so many things. We could ask for a reduction in crime. We could ask for just uh, our taxes to go down. We could ask for better traffic and no one running red lights. But Lord, we ask tonight that as we discuss and dialogue with the people who make our city work, we ask that you would give us wisdom. I ask, Lord, that I thank you, Lord, for Mayor Blangiardi and his concern for the city with which he, he runs and takes care of. I thank you for his staff, who each and who specialize in what you've called them to do. And would you give them wisdom, wisdom to receive these questions and, and feel these concerns? But Lord, would you give us wisdom, we, the citizenry of these, this area that we love so much, that we would be wise in what we say, 
that we would word our, our, our concerns carefully, that we would not let emotion crowd in the way of what is really important. And there are so many concerns, and many of them conflict with one another. But Lord, to, to quote uh, an obscure German theologian uh, to kind of slaughter what he said and misquote it a little, but Lord, in all things, in the essentials, let there be unity. In the non-essentials, let there be liberty. But in all things, let there be charity and love so that we may navigate through this evening for a better future and a better today and a better tomorrow for the neighborhoods we love so much. Thank you, Lord, for this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Lum. Thank you. Yeah, let's give a round of applause. Tonight is our 10th town hall. Uh, and we began this journey two and a half months ago. And it's really been a journey of learning for us. And I don't know how many of you, and I'm sure Lloyd, when he gets introduced in a moment or two, is going to ask how many on the neighborhood boards. But this is different than a neighborhood board meeting. And before I have our cabinet introduce themselves, and I'm so proud of these men and women, a couple of them are spread out up here, uh, I, I'm going to start it off tonight with we have two young ladies here that are part of our youth commission. When we first came into office, one of the things that we wanted to do was start a youth commission uh, because we really felt that so much of the work we do is about the future. And so why wouldn't we want to have young people around us with their voices, with their minds, with their spirits, you know, to, to do what someday hopefully they'll be doing, some of the men and women up here are doing. So with that, and we never tell them what they can say, I only ask in the sake of brevity, a couple of minutes, ladies, uh, and Kylie, we'll start off with you, okay? Uh, aloha my kako. Aloha everyone, my name is Kylie Akiona. They share their pronouns, and I'm the youth commissioner for District 2, which is like around Central Oahu and Mililani. Um, so our role as youth commissioners, and I'm here with Charlotte, is to basically advocate for and champion issues that are relating to youth, to folks like the cabinet behind me, and to people like Mayor Blangiardi. And some of the stuff that we've been working on lately is defueling Red Hill, um, youth trafficking and sexual violence, youth involvement in the criminal legal system and interventions to get them out of that cycle of criminalization and incarceration, educational inequities and more. So please feel free to come up to us and talk story at any time. Um, we're more than happy to hear about what you care about. So mahalo to all of you for coming out today. Um, I love this community. My grandparents live up Aleva Drive and my great grandpa built Aleva Drive. So I'm just really thankful to be here tonight and to be a part of your community and to be welcomed here. Um, but yeah, and also please join us at the Youth Commission meetings if you and your keiki or their friends or if you have youth that you care about would like to um, just talk story in Vala'o. We have meetings every second Tuesday of the month at 5.30 on WebEx, so please feel free to join us and check us out just by Googling Honolulu Youth Commission, so mahalo. Thank you, Kali. Thank you. Charlotte, you're up. Thank you. Well done. Nicely done. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Charlotte Campbell. I'm currently a junior in high school this year, and it's my first year on the Youth Commission. But um, I'm already the vice chair of the Youth Commission. And with my position, I've definitely taken a focus on focusing more on disability access. Um, that was my first resolution that I passed. It was actually unanimous. Um, and I have another one coming in the works. So. Feel free to um, ask me any questions. Just talk story. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So ordinarily, I uh, would announce the elected officials that are in the audience, and I don't see any here yet. However, we had a long list, so they may be late arriving, and then again, they may not. Uh, but I'd like to kick off the meeting first and foremost by having you and having the members of our cabinet introduce themselves. Uh, this is an extraordinary group of men and women. I've now had the privilege of working with them for nearly two and a half years. Um, but I just would give you a perspective. When this team came together, it was in the months of November and December 2020. And those were very dark hours on our island. We were smack dab in the middle of COVID. 
and there were no talks of vaccines even being readily available until maybe the end of 2021. There was a lot of fear, there was a lot of uncertainty, and here we were putting together a new team because, believe me, being responsible for the city and county of Honolulu is definitely a team sport. And they'll be the first to tell you, it's not just the men and women that are up here, but it's a lot of other people. It's the 9,000 plus employees that we have. It's a really big human organization and requires extraordinary leadership. And I could not be more proud of the people that are here. So I'm gonna have them introduce themselves first briefly. Just say what you want about who you are. You know, and Ernie, you're, well, we're gonna start with Ted. First of all, Clark Bright is hiding over here. He's our band master for the Royal Hawaiian Band. I tell you, yeah, everybody works hard, but I have to tell you, this Royal Hawaiian Band is really special. How many performances, you do like, you do more performances than there are days in the year. 350. 350, wow, wow, amazing. I am going to move away from the speaker tonight, after last week. Um, hi, I'm Ted Burke. I'm the Early Childhood Coordinator for the City and County of Honolulu. And uh, the main role I'm taking on is trying to provide families in Honolulu um, opportunities to access affordable, high-quality early childhood opportunities. So we've been working a lot with the state and private partners, and I did bring some flyers. I don't know if you saw the announcement yesterday by the Lieutenant Governor that they're opening 11 new free preschool classrooms uh, across the state, and one is over at Fern Elementary. So that classroom is going to open up this August, and for the first time, it's open to three-year-olds as well. So it used to just be four-year-olds, so three and four-year-olds. So I'm gonna, I have some flyers if you want to catch me. If you have any three and four-year-olds yourself or know of any, um, catch me afterwards. Thanks. Ernie? Uh, Aloha mai kako, uh, Ernie Lau, Port of Water Supply. Aloha. Hi everyone, I'm Kim Hashiro. I'm the Director for the Department of Customer Services. We provide services in the area of driver's licensing, motor vehicle registration, satellite city halls, and public communication. Aloha everyone, good evening. Thank you for having us in your community. My name is Laura Thielen and I'm the director for the City and County Department of Parks and Recreation. Aloha, Joe Logan, police chief for a wonderful organization of men and women that are here to provide safety and security to the City and County of Honolulu. Aloha, Keith Orikawa, deputy chief, HPD. Honored to serve you. Aloha, my name is Jim Ireland. I'm the director of the Emergency Services Department. We have EMS, which is Ambulance Services, Ocean Safety and Lifeguard Services, Health Services, which is the city's um, uh, occupational health, as, as well as now the new core branch. I'm wearing the core shirt tonight, which is dealing with homelessness um, in our streets. Thank you. Aloha, I'm Carrie Castle. I'm the deputy director with the Budget and Fiscal Services Department and I uh, appreciate you all joining us this evening. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jiro Sumata. I'm the Deputy Director for the Department of Planning and Permitting. Aloha. My name is Stephen Courtney. I'm the Deputy Director for Information Technology. Yeah, we're the ones that provide the computer network and data storage that's utilized by all these departments um, for the city. And also my other job is the, um, I'm also the mayor's rep to the Kalia Palama Neighborhood Board. And I'm glad I'm here because I'm finally be able to meet some of, some of the board members in person. Thank you. Aloha everyone, Sam Moku, Chief of Staff for Mayor Blangiardi. Glad to be here. Good evening everybody, Krishna Jairam. I'm the Deputy Managing Director. Thank you for having us here and thank you for being here. Good evening, Mike Formby, Managing Director. Good evening and aloha, I'm Nola Miyasaki. I'm the Director of Human Resources. And as you've probably seen in the news, we um, help manage the city's workforce of almost more than 10,000 people. And we're looking for great people to join our ohana. So I brought one of my top recruiters at our jobs table at the back of the room, Andrew Hinkle, and we love to share 
um, our job opportunities with you and your family or friends and anyone that might be interested. So please go and see him when you have a chance. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Kat Tashner. I am the director designate for the Department of Land Management. We protect, develop, and manage the city's land. Thank you so much for having us tonight. Good evening. Uh, I'm Haku Millis. I'm the director for the Department of Design and Construction. Uh, I'm very happy to be here because I live about five minutes away. Um, so thank you guys for being here. Hello, Mike Haku, John Nouchi, deputy director of the Department of Transportation Services. Uh, we plan and engineer roads and streets so that everybody can walk or roll on them better and most importantly, safely. Really happy to be here tonight. Aloha, good evening. My name is Matt Gonser and I serve as the Executive Director for the City's Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency, which was established by the voters in 2016. Aloha and good evening. Uh, Warren Mamizuka, Acting uh, Director for the Department of Facility Maintenance. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Erwin Kawata. I'm the Deputy Manager at the Board of Water Supply. I'm Hiro Toya, the director for the Department of Emergency Management. Uh, we deal with disasters. <laughs> Aloha, everyone. Mike O'Keefe. Uh, I'm deputy director with the city's Department of Environmental Services. We manage most of the island's wastewater, which includes uh, nine wastewater treatment plants, 71 pump stations, and 2,100 miles of sewer systems and uh, also most of the solid waste, which includes uh, H-Power, our waste energy facility, uh, the Waimanalo Gulch landfill, three transfer stations, and seven base yards. Happy to be here, thank you. Good evening, Kim Sparlin, Deputy Director at the Office of Economic Revitalization, one of your newest offices pumping out almost $51 million in rental and utility relief into this community. Um, and business recovery grants totaling about 800,000 right now have gone to several businesses in this area. So we're keeping up that good work. Happy to support you and happy to hear what your concerns are. Hello, good evening. Um, Kalani Hao, Fire Chief of the Honolulu Fire Department. Happy to be here. Aloha, Jerry Papillo, uh, Department of Enterprise Services. We handle the Blaisdell six golf courses, the Waikiki Shell and the Honolulu Zoo. and. Um, it's great to be back in Kalihi. I was fortunate enough years ago to uh, be a coach at Farrington High School for the wrestling team and great experience, great people, tough kids, and uh, they stayed true to their, to their mission. Thank you. Good evening, Lori Kahikina, CEO and Executive Director of HEART, and we'll be transferring over the first segment to DTS within the next month and opening up on June 30th. Good evening, Lloyd Yonenaka. I am the Executive Secretary to the Neighborhood Commission, and we oversee all of the neighborhood boards. I know Kevin's here. Who else is here from the boards? Okay. Oh, my friend. Sorry, Mayor, a lot of them aren't here because they're in the community doing what needs to be done for their community. <laughs> Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, a couple other people. Where's Makanani Salah? Right here. She is, heads up our uh, Office of Culture and the Arts. And then our communications team is also here. Scott Humber, Director of Communications. Ian Schering, Deputy Manager. Where's Brandy? She's videotaping something. There's Brandy right there. I think that covers our team for the most part. Except Officer Turner. I don't want you to be upset, but we know it's your birthday today, so I want to thank you for being with us tonight on your birthday. Thank Happy you. birthday, sir. Hey, very nice. Very nice, very nice. So, you know, look, I brought, up, I brought up the issue of COVID and the time the team came together because for me, that was significant because getting elected to become mayor at my stage of, the life, of life was really the honor of a lifetime, but simultaneously the challenge of a lifetime. And everybody we asked to join our team who wanted to come on to it, they understood that we would all be dealing with unprecedented challenges, and in many cases, maybe for each and everybody up here, the challenge of a lifetime. And that's what we've signed up for. So the extension of that is to put ourselves in touch with the community as much as possible. And that's why the last two and a half months have been so beneficial for us. They've been educational, and I think we've tried to do some good. I, we established contacts 
so you can have a direct line of communication. That's why we stay around afterwards. Maybe even during the course of the evening, a couple might come down to you based on the questions that's, at, that's asked. But that's what we want to get done tonight. We want to answer as many questions that you might have as, mu as, as thoroughly as possible. So a couple of ground rules. One, I'm the moderator, okay? And, and I'm gonna be kind and nice, but I will tell you that um, what we're not into is long speeches up at the microphone, okay? We're gonna ask you to get to your question. You can give us a little bit of context, okay? Uh, but not a long speech because we wanna cover as many people. When 810 comes tonight, we wanna to feel like everybody who came here had not only the opportunity to answer your question, to ask a question and have it answered, but at the same time, um, establish the right contact if it's gonna require uh, ongoing proceedings, okay? Uh, that said, and I was so pleased tonight with Pastor Lum starting off, and I really did like the words and the tone that he set tonight. Um, we ask that you be polite and civil because we will be that way back to you, all right? And, and I think we can hopefully achieve our objective, which we've been able to do, I think, in every one, is to um, have the people who came for the night and spent a couple of hours with us feel like it was really worth their time because we have a lot of respect for your time, okay? So the other thing I'd like to suggest, and I hope that this crowd will do this, there's no need to form a long line. You know, you can come up one at a time and, you know, and, and we'll get to you. We will get to you. So if you want to do that, I'm not going to stop you from doing it, but I think you end up standing for a long time in line when you could be seated and just come over there, okay? All right, so like I said, we're here to answer your questions um, and we're excited to learn what you, is on your mind. We've been looking forward to this particular one because not lost on us what we're doing with the rail coming down the Dillingham Corridor and really overall the neighborhoods here and the concerns and questions you might have. So let's have at it. Who wants to go first? And somebody has to go first. Here we go. All right, yeah. We get the ball rolling. Here we go. All right. So all I ask is just give us your name and who you are and go have at it. Go ahead. Yeah. Aloha mai kako. Mahalo nui for coming here in Kalihi Kapalama. It is, uh, I remember PBS Hawaii saying that this is the gathering place. This is where everyone comes before, you know, they reach their intended area. Um, so recently, I think one week within this month or last month, we did experience, I did experience a lot of um, near crime around my area, especially on North School Street. So uh, within that one week, there were three police callings. The first one was for Grand Theft Auto, attempted Grand Theft Auto and burglary, where uh, they broke into my apartment and then they tried to drive off with a stolen car, but thankfully it got hit in the pillar. The second time was that apparently in 21 Mart, a man was assaulted. And then the third time, I don't know what it was for, but we have a lo'i kalo patch. And the lo'i, um, it was basically just, uh, it just had police. And I was like, oh, well, I wonder what the police is here for, but I bet it's gonna be on the news again. So Kalihik Palama has had experiences with crime and issues. And I wonder if there's any like ways we can resolve it and if there has been any forms of enforcing uh, use, using the police and if there are preventative measures that we can take from making sure that there is less crime within our community. All right, thank you. Chief. So there are ways to curb crime. I will tell you that overall crime is down in Honolulu by and large, and even in this district of District 5, crime is down overall uh, in all categories, uh, with the exception of one, which is not one of the ones that you mentioned. Um, and so the police are out here in force doing their job. However, we're not everywhere and we can't be everywhere. Um, um, but our officers that are patrolling out there do their best. So if you see something, you call 911 and the officers will get there as soon as they can and they'll investigate the crimes. And we have the leadership here from the district that can answer specifically offline any questions that you have about the specific crime that you are. But the officers are out here 
uh, doing the best they can to deter, deter crime uh, before it happens um, and then investigate the crime after it happens. But we can't be everywhere all at, at, at every minute of every day. They have beats that they patrol uh, and patrol in that manner. Does that answer your question or do you? Yes, mahalo nui. Thank you. You know, maybe some of you heard me said this, but we want to make sure we impress upon everybody. This represents a lot of diversity in the workforce because a lot of different components to running the city. And in my mind as mayor, all of them and their work are priorities. But if there's one priority that's more equal than all the others, it's public safety. And when I think about public safety, first and foremost, what comes to top of mind is our police department and the incredible responsibility they have. But we want you to know that we're taking that issue real, most seriously. I think we all know, Chief hasn't, didn't bring it up, we all know that we're out there recruiting heavily for police officers. We want to expand our force, but we still have 1,800 officers, and they're really top, top flight police officers and you know we support that department because we know how important it is for all of you to feel safe where you live and I don't think any of us is satisfied where things are I am pleased to learn that crime is down um, but we all feel like we can do a better job against people who think they can go out and mess up people's lives so that said who's up next come on Wes Fung come on up Wes you don't have to raise your hand. You can just, after the person finishes, get up and come on over. But if you want to raise your hand, that's okay, too. Go ahead. I've been well trained. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the mayor and his team for doing such a wonderful job. I think they deserve a big round of applause, especially in Chinatown. Thank you. Yeah. I'm uh, Wesley Fong, and for those of you who know, know, I'm the uh, chair of Neighborhood Board 14, which is up there. One of the common issues that we have with Neighborhood Board 15 is we have monster homes. And thanks to Gerald back there, we gave him a little hard time the last time he was with our Neighborhood Board. But I hear there's progress being made in regards to these homes that really, I, I remember one that was on uh, Hall Drive, had uh, 13 toilets, oh no, strict that, 23 toilets. So I'd like to know what the city's doing about all okay. of these. Good question, Wes. Yeah. Thank you. Jiro. Uh, Jiro Sumata from D DPP. We actually uh, have a kind of a thorough program as we go through new permits, reviews. Uh, the director, Don Takeo Chapuna, she actually is getting personally involved in many of them. Recently, we revoked three building permits. Two of them were today, were done today. Uh, and in your, in your area, Mr. Fong. So uh, we are making progress. We are clamping down and uh, trying to stop them before they start construction. That's kind of the main thing. Uh, so we, we, we do have a program to make sure that we catch them early. Yeah, we're going to try to stop them before they start construction. And if they're constructing illegally, we're going to stop that operation as well. But what we can't do, just so you know, is we can't knock them down. I thought we could. Because somewhere when I was running for me, everybody was talking about knock down the monster homes. But I have enough lawyers telling me, even though I want to do that, we can't do that. But we can't stop them. We can't stop them in the midst, and then we'll, we'll see how they deal with that. Okay, you all right with that? Hello. I lost my, there we go. Randy Ching, I'm a volunteer with the Sierra Club. I've been volunteering for about 35 years. And I want to uh, congratulate Ernie Lau for taking care of our water. Um, I'm very concerned about the Red Hill issue and the Navy poisoning our drinking water. And I think the Board of Water Supply has been absolutely fantastic. And Ernie has been the most incredible advocate possible for the protection of our waters. I do have one question, and that is, has been, have there been any updates on the Navy's defueling uh, the aviation or jet fuel tanks? Are yes, we, are there, we... there is. I'll let Ernie handle this. Come on up, Ernie. And you know what? Ernie's gotten a lot of acknowledgement throughout the last 10 town halls, deservedly so, Randy. So your comments are what we've heard consistently. So 
very proud of Ernie. Mahalo, Randy. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody. It's good to see you again, Randy. It's been a while. Uh, mahalo for the support. Uh, update on the Red Hill defueling of the tanks. Right now, there's 104 million gallons of diesel and jet fuel in about 14 of those tanks. Um, <clears throat> they've been just released this week an uh, update that says they're going to start defueling in October of this year and finish by January of this year. Uh, so that's really a, a move uh, shortening the time frame because it was originally middle of 2024 when they were going to complete defueling. <clears throat> the caveat being uh, they in also indicated that there's going to be about 100,000 to 400,000 gallons of diesel or jet fuel still in the system there. And uh, I just got a call from the guy in charge of defueling, Vice Admiral John Wade, this morning. And I, uh, he's offered to me to sit, allow me to sit down with his engineers to find out exactly to find out exactly why they can't defuel that remaining fuel. Uh, and I'm going to be doing that in the next week or so. So mahalo everybody for staying on the Red Hill issue. Thank you for Sierra Club for your support. And the Wahoo Water Protectors, our Kanaka Maoli, have been magnificent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Ernie. Come on. There's got to be someone else. We've got a lot of time here. Sir, come on up. Yep. And by the way, I don't know if I said this. You can ask us anything you want, okay? Yeah, anything you want. And the only thing I will tell you as a quid pro quo is you may not like the answer you're going to get. But the one thing we're committed to doing is to tell you the truth on what only we believe, but what's real. Okay, so as long as we have that understanding, have at it. One question per person, though. Go ahead at first, then you can come back at later. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. My name is James Sung. Um, my one question is, and I guess it's for our uh, Department of Transportation, who already acknowledged uh, um, is all these speed bumps. Um, putting speed bumps to slow down traffic mitigation, trying to reduce speed, trying to curb people from speeding. But in the um, book of geometric designs and all that, there's like 30 different speed reduction tools out there. Um, you kind of did one in Chinatown, the sidewalk chicaneries, kind of half did it, didn't quite work. Um, there's, you can plant trees. The, for right over here, the Klee Street, instead of putting all these uh, speed bumps, there's got, what, five, six of them? Instead of putting those, you can put the hawker system in. So if there's an emergency going down Klee Street, police officers, fire department, the ambulance, they don't have to slow down like everybody else, but they have to with their speed bump. But you put in a hawker system, lets people know that there's a, a, someone crossing, and you can see it okay. a lot farther away. So what's your question? So Just my go. question is, what can we do besides speed bumps? And have you started looking at other things besides speed bumps? The oh. sidewalk chicanery in Chinatown is kind of good, but you guys only did it halfway. You know, um, that question, mahalo, mahalo, mahalo for that question. It's music to my ears. Um, a lot of times we get requests from neighborhoods saying, I want a speed hump. I want a roundabout. I want, and they ask for very specific things. And we always dig a little bit deeper with that request and we say, help us identify the problem that you're, you're trying to solve. And sir, I absolutely 100% agree with you. We have a team of engineers and planners and we conform to what's called the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. The MUTCD is an engineer's Bible, if you will of everything that we can use situationally. And I think, um, especially for some of our, um, our city council members' aides, they always hear me talk in public about the toolkit that's available to us. And I think everybody, because speed humps are becoming more ubiquitous, more and more common in, in our city now, and it it's, has a lot to do with the lead of the State Department of Transportation. Um, they've started to install 
speed humps in places where they wanted to test how, what the effect was on reducing speeds on roads. So one of them is right out here on Kalihi Street. Unbeknownst to a lot of people, Kalihi Street is actually a state road. And that's because it leads from the harbor, the Kapalama um, container yard, up to the freeway system. So that was one of the places, the second places, I think the State Department of Transportation did install those. But DTS, our cadre of engineers and planners, we like to look at the things that we can do. So we also, like up in, um, in Makiki, or about, I guess Pool, why not, Punch Bowl, there's an awkward five-way intersection that we're currently looking at with Councilmember Dos Santos Tam and the community up there. And everybody first said speed humps. We said, okay, hold on. That could be used, but there are places we cannot do speed bumps or speed humps. And so we're, we're looking through, like I said, the toolkit that we have. You can do, we can do um, roundabouts, traffic circles, ball bouts. There's all these technologies, delineators. We put some up on Harding Avenue uh, this past week to control speeding in that section between Kapahulu and uh, Fifth Avenue. And we found that they worked pretty good so far. And um, Mary, you can pull the, the, the cane on me at any time. Well, I think it's wonderful that you, you want to know about this stuff. <laughs> I mean, John is, he's the guy. I mean, right here. OK. But, but to your point, sir, I 100% agree with you. Um, and I, I would remind the community, you know, the first thing you can do to help us make your street safer is help us identify what specifically is the problem. Um, we have a lot of that going on right now where um, we have other technologies we can use. Right. We have choices. And can All I go right, one more, Mayor? Sorry. Yeah, you go one more. And then I want to bring you back up because I want to hear what the beef is about Chinatown because you alluded to it twice that we didn't quite get it right. I'd like to kind of get your observation. But let me talk a little bit about it. We do have something called speed cushions. So there's humps and bumps and cushions and there's probably going to be something called a speed lump pretty soon that we don't even know about. But um, the speed cushions are something that we're going to demonstrate in Waianae. And what that is, is it's a speed hump that goes across the whole road, but it has a wide two grooves cut out in each lane that actually only accommodates large axled vehicles such as uh, fire engines and buses and ambulances. So those vehicles can actually make it past each of those humps, each of those cushions without having to slow down. So, I mean, to your point, there, there are a bunch of things we do, but if you want to talk a little bit about the, the curb extensions we did in Chinatown. So thank you for putting those in, that, that's excellent. Um, you know, you have a uh, collector road. So Mauna Kea is a collector road, right? And then you have all these side streets. Um, collector roads get the traffic from one end of the town to the other side of the town. They're a little bit more on the faster speed. You have this, the curb extensions to reduce the traffic. People aren't parking on the curbs. Thank you for that. But those curb extensions should be actually at sidewalk level. And then when you're going from a collector road onto a street, that's where you should have the uh, speed hump and make it at sidewalk level so people when they're going from a collector road onto a street they know a you're going into pedestrian area second of all since the curb the sidewalk is the same level as the uh, crosswalk now is people now this is their area this, they feel safe even though it's in the middle of the street right so people coming from a car from a road onto a street, they know, slow down, stop, I'm now going into a pedestrian area. Mm -hmm. And so you don't need to have that drop down for someone in a wheelchair. They're able to easily get through on, on it. They're not struggling getting up and down. And it just helps them out. And having that curb extension out for the Kapuna, they're able to get a little bit farther out. Now instead of trying to cross what, 40, 50 feet, right, of a street, now they're only crossing maybe 20 feet, and they're still on the sidewalk. They're not going to get a jaywalking ticket from someone who's trying to... Sir, no can you come with me to some of these meetings and stand yeah. by me and, and report that back to the community? <laughs> I'll tell you, I got one better. You heard Noah said we're recruiting. Um, <laughs> hey, we could have a, you have a great job with us, man. I, I, I'm impressed with what you're saying. But I want to move on to the next topic. But we hear you. And maybe you and John could talk a little bit more about it. And Chief Logan, not to put you on the spot, I don't know if it was you that told me, but when you talk about the preponderance of speed bumps, 
is I was told, we used to get like five or six requests, I don't know if it was a month or a year, we're getting them weekly now. It's in vogue around the island. And quite honestly, you're the first person in all the people that we've had, and this subject has come up in just about every town hall meeting, but it's always been about adding more speed bumps. Nobody's come up to talk about what you just did. So really appreciate the thinking and the insight. And John's going to come make contact with you. And I'll meet you Monday morning in front of Honolulu Holiday. And <laughs> it's all good. All right, who's up next? Because I know we have some written questions, too, that came in. So we're going to want to get up and ask. So Mark and I, oh, here we go. Hey, come on up. Yeah. Yeah, Mark and I is going to be our safeguard. She just showed me five or six written questions from people, and we'll address those. Okay. Sorry, I'm the size of a no. peanut. That's okay. It's okay. I also had to write it down so my thoughts were concise. Good. <laughs> Aloha, my name is Teo Ku'ule Terio, and my testimony is in regarding to an appeal. Veto Bill 41, which was enacted to protect local communities and preserve natural resources, thus zoning bed and breakfasts, Airbnbs, to resort and tourist sanctioned parts of our island. The Airbnb platform when empowered to Kanaka and Kama'aina is a tool to counteract over tourism and educate Malahini. This offers an authentic Hawaiian experience that takes place outside of Waikiki, Lanikai, and Kahala. So I guess my question to you, Mr. Mayor, is what are you doing to help the hardworking Kanakas that relied on these Airbnb and bed and breakfasts to make ends meet? What was the point of regulating local Airbnbs? Okay. Local legal Airbnbs, I call them. Is it a legal Airbnb? It's a it's a legal Airbnb. Well, we didn't break. We didn't. You know, if you have a legal, did you have one from before? Was yes. Was it original? We didn't. We didn't regulate those. What we did, what we did, with Bill Forty One, was we attacked the short-term illegal vacation rentals, of which it was estimated in 2019, before COVID, that we had some 3 million people out of the 10.7 million visitors stay in illegal short-term vacation rentals. What that did was disrupted neighborhoods. It overcrowded our, our, our Aina, mm -hmm. everything. I mean, the beaches, the restaurants, everything. This is pre-COVID now. If you talk to the hotel operators, they will tell you, although there's a new one going up in Kalakau right now, there's not been a lot of new hotel rooms, that at a high level of occupancy, over 90%, which is atypical, on a 12-month basis, our sweet spot for tourism on a statewide basis is about 7,500 to 8,000. We had almost 11,000. If COVID didn't hit, we would have had over 11,000 in 2020. Last year, in 2022, and we're still in a recovery mode because we've just now begun to enact our enforcement, we still did 9.2 million visitors. Mm -hmm. And just this morning in a staff meeting, I told our team, the way things are pacing, we're going to be back up in 2023 at over 10 million. We can't handle that. And a lot of those people, millions, millions of those people, are staying in neighborhoods. So if you have... If you've been grandfathered in or if you registered and applied, we've got that open up where we're, we're taking care of um, legal vacation rentals in the right zones. So I'm not really quite sure what well, you're saying. My, grand, or my parents were grandfathered in. They were part of Airbnb since 2019. You know, their business or... Where is the location? Nu'uanu. But it was, we were told that because we weren't within the zoning process of Waikiki or Ko'olina yeah. that we weren't allowed to okay. operate. Here's what we'd like to do. I, I missed your first name, and I'm sorry. But I'm going to put Jero in touch with you, That'd and we'll follow up. I don't know if you've seen it, but a couple of people have already gone back down. And I said that earlier tonight. We want to have the direct contact because we know they're trying to reach these people in normal channels, normal times. This is sort of your reward for being here. Is you're going to get some really hands-on um, experience, okay? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Mayor and evening. the Cabinet that's here. Thank you so much for having this town hall meeting in Kalihi. First, I always like to give credit where credit's due. You work very hard for the community. Much big mahalo to you. First and second, um, thank you for opening up the Ivole um, respite spot that has been long time waiting for the community. Big mahalo to that. Yeah, we might be able to share some color on that, but go ahead with your question. 
Um, I just want to give thanks first. Okay. And then for cleaning up the homeless encampment that was in and underneath the stream area and the roadway, um, that population has been long time coming to receive help. So thank you so much for all your efforts. I have two things. Well, I have a couple of things. I'm born and raised in Kalihi, 40 plus years. I'm the youngest out of my generation, so it's over 100 years. Um, that being said, I live on po uh, Pohaku Street in Kalihi. There, and there's a lot of violence in that area. It's very upsetting. I'm extremely tired. I myself am an investigator for sex abuse. I'm very tired being here right now. With that being said, a lot of violence, gun violence. My auntie's car was broken into. Yeah. There's only so much I can do as a neighborhood board person. I walk the streets and I talk to the people. I even speak to the people in the game rooms. And that's very dangerous. And I still do that. So whatever can be done to please help, because I'm exhausted. Yeah. I and remember you from the Kali Palama neighborhood yeah, board meeting. I I'm remember very exhausted you. right now. OK. So what is your question, though? What more can be done? Like, I support HPD, and I helped with that resol that got passed, resol number SCR40, for there to be a coalition, a collaboration of DOE and HPD for the training program for the state of Hawaii. What can you do to help support that? Chief, I'm going to, you want to take a shot at that? Either one of you, Keith? Okay. Hi, Ola, thank you for your question. Again, I'm a Deputy Chief Horikawa. Uh, I'm in charge of the field operations, which is all patrol and investigative units, uh, which includes our District 5, District 1 folks over here as well. Um, so to kind of give you a little update on some of our, um, I guess, our uh, initiatives or some of our focus areas that we're, we're trying to work on, uh, you know, granted that, yeah, there's just, and there is some issues with game rooms, uh, violence associated with that. We did, ha we did have a couple of uh, armed robberies involving game rooms uh, within the last couple of weeks. Um, what we've been kind of focusing on is a lot, been looking at some of the, um, the underlying crimes that kind of, kind of feed that. So a lot of it is drug crimes, right, gambling and so forth. Um, what we've been doing is uh, trying to better leverage our support units such as our narcotics advice division, our crew units as well, um, to kind of, kind of take a, a deeper look at um, those crimes and which, you know, does translate into what our patrol folks um, experience and what you guys see on the road right, right now. Um, so with that, you know, we did have a, a big operation that was um, publicized uh, last week. It was called Operation, operation Firestorm, um, led by our Narcotics Vice Division, focused on uh, gambling, you know, drugs, uh, some of the human trafficking uh, elements, some of our, our vice crimes. And that's, that was just the first phase of that. Focused on the Leeward District 8 areas. Um, so it's like a collaborative effort that we did with the federal agencies, DEA, HSI, FBI, working with the prosecutor's office, of course, our, our HPD guys here. And that's, that was just the first step of what we're trying to do as far as um, you know, just, just focus on those crimes. Um, it, it will be uh, addressed here as well it, it, within district. This uh, district, we did, we did have a, a violent um, uh, event with, with one of the game rooms uh, right, right, right here in, um, in Kalihi just, just about a week ago. So that's what, we, what we're trying to do. Again, um, better leverage our resources, not just within HPD, but also within the federal agencies. And, and just try to attack those problems. Um, pretty confident that we'll see some pretty good results. So with that too, we're looking at um, not just arresting those people, right, but shutting down those businesses, um, you know, working with, uh, even with the DPP and, you know, some of our other uh, uh, city agencies to, to get those guys as far as, you know, the permitting and, and some, some other uh, wrongdoings that, that they're doing. So, we're, you know, just give us some time, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get this done. Um, it, it, if I can also ask, you know, um, in addition to, to, to some of that, you know, we do have pretty good uh, neighborhood, neighborhood watches here. You know, that, that, that helps us out tremendously as far as, because, we, again, we, we can't be everywhere, but the more eyes we have out there to report stuff, give us information, the better that, that we, the more information that we have to, to better do our jobs as well. But, but thank you for your question. Any, well, any other questions you have? Well, yeah, I want to ask you, I mean, since you, you know, I want to ask you, since you're so intimately involved with it, and as you said, you're exhausted from it. Exhausted. What is it you would like to say? I appreciate everything that Chief Horikawa just said, but what is it, you, since you're up close and personal and you're a trained professional, what is it that you think is missing that maybe we could do? What suggestion would you make? My suggestion is because of the high crime rate and the um, concentration of it, there's a concentration of it undoubtedly within the area. 
if there can be narco vice special undercover units and other specialized units that whenever there's a high volume and concentration of crime that is currently happening at the moment that there's a sting operation that stays active in that um, area until it can settle down a little bit more. Right, and, and again, that's part of our, um, the reasons why we wanna you know, build these operations, special operations, get other folks involved, uh, um, you know, include resources that we don't have organically within the department and, and try to make that happen as well, so, but yeah. I would love to do Neighborhood Watch, but I have been approached too, so I can't, I can't be awake 24 seven to protect family and friends from people that use guns because there's ghost guns. In fact, at 21 Mart right up the street from me, um, there was a gunfight between two warring gangs and that was about three weeks ago. Okay. And they used ghost guns to shoot at each other. Okay. So I am very mindful because I have to live amongst them. Right. I have to live amongst them. You understand that? Understand it's, very totally, yeah. it's very different for me. I don't live in a condominium that is protected and gated with security cameras and security. Right. I live in a single family home that's made out of wood. And if they shoot, I'm done. And so is my family or, or other innocent passerbyers. Things are very dangerous, and that's why I'm here. Okay. Great. Thank, thanks, Thank Ryan. You. And again, Chief. any information that you can, you can uh, pro provide to us. Yeah, if you we, stay you know, around, oh, maybe you can even go back and get some specific information from you now. We, if you don't mind, sir, we had uh, another cabinet member come in. I don't think any of the elected officials have come in, but I'd like you to meet this man. Thank you, Mayor. Anton Krecke, I'm the Director of the Department of Community Services, and we do all human service activities, whether it be Section 8 activities, buying buildings for special needs, um, all of those type of activities for you, all the GIA grants that, that happen. We also have Work Hawaii that does outreach in this community and also does job training. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Anton. And actually, Anton was very instrumental in the program that Jim's now running, Dr. Ireland with CORE and developing a strategy on how we were going to attack our homeless crisis. Uh, okay, come on, who's up? Uh, you're back. I know, I'm back. That's okay. <laughs> Thank it's you. Okay, as long as we're taking turns, I just don't want one person up there filibustering for an hour. Go I ahead. know, yeah, definitely. But yeah, uh, as said, I live on the, as Amanda said, um, she lives in Pohaco Street, I live in Pohaco Street, and as she discussed, she doesn't live in a condo, I do, and as I said, I experienced the robbery, uh, not experienced the robbery, but my um, neighbors experienced a robbery. And in fact, I do wanna bring this up too. My family's car, within a decade of living here, I've lived here for pretty much all my life. Within a decade, we have experienced seven, seven break-ins within my dad and my mother's car. Uh, and this is a condo. So, um, since Amanda did bring up uh, what's called suggestions, I do also want to suggest that possibly you guys could introduce more resolutions to help not be more tough on crime, but rather alleviate the problems of crime, uh, find the root causes such as mental health, better education, um, and so many more. And I think that you guys, I know that we have such a shortage with uh, our programs, like our summer fund programs and everything, but it does come a long way. And I think that it would help so much if we can just have a bit more funding and a bit more spending on the programs that could be used instead of more policing. I know that I did bring up enforcing, but the fact is, is that Kalihikapalama, it's such a huge like town with such a huge problem with, especially with crime, especially with transportation and everything. And the best way we can do it is find the root problem and alleviate with it. There are programs and we have seen success with it. Mahalo Nui. Thank you. And we don't disagree. In fact, a lot of what CORE is about is precisely that. It's about the programs, it's having wraparound services. Chief, you wanna say, go ahead. In fact, Jim, you might wanna give a little bit of a thing too. No, thank you for the question and, and I think, uh, Sorry that you're victims of multiple crimes and, and, and that's unfortunate crime is happening. And you're absolutely right, you're bringing up social issues that are not just law enforcement uh, can solve. It's gotta be solved by the community as a whole, by everyone up here behind me and all of you out there to help in, in the community to one, 
as the deputy said, report crimes that you see. But more importantly, we need social, uh, a way to help our individuals that have committed crimes over and over again are not staying in jail. They're not held accountable for the actions that they're performing uh, or the actions that they're taking against you as citizens. And so, you know, the job of law enforcement is to enter them in the criminal, criminal justice system. It's up to that system to do it and hold them accountable. And so for right now, that's not happening at, at, at the rate or I think that the community would like to see more of. I think you'd like to see people held accountable for the crimes that they get caught doing and, and spend that time in jail so they're not out committing more crimes. Uh, like I said earlier, crime is down overall. Uh, but any time crime happens to you, it becomes personal, uh, and then your perception is that crime is happening. And, and granted, you've been a victim over seven times in a number of years. Uh, that gives you the perception that crime continues, which it is for you, um, and, and that's not a good thing. So how do we, and how many times is it the same person over again, or perhaps the same family? So I use this analogy that it takes... Uh, people say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it does, but it takes that same village to raise a criminal and keep that criminal going in the community because they're not taking action. They're not talking to the families that raised the criminal, and we're not putting the person in jail, and the jail's not keeping people in prison. So it's really it's a larger community problem. So how do we solve that problem? We can't do it alone. We need a lot of assistance and outside help. Um, and so I implore all of you, uh, if you see something, to report crime, but also, you know, talk to your elected officials, talk to the state, and how we can work together. I know the mayor and the governor are working towards a uh, program that's helping with the individuals that are committing crimes and the homeless individuals that are out there on the streets 24/7 uh, that have the uh, that, that wait for opportunities to commit crimes. And so, how do we help those individuals get off the streets and get into shelters and help? So that's a start. Uh, but we're in, a, we're in a long road to get to that. But I think we're on a, the momentum is working in that direction. Thank you, Chief. I believe that. I want Dr. Island to talk a little bit about, um, you know, in dealing with the homeless population, within that there's a criminal element as well. And, 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 and so we worked, to Chief's point of view, and almost trying to separate them. And, and yet, you know, because dealing with the homeless issues is not easily done. Most of the people you see on the streets have been out there for 10 years or more, and a high percentage, if not all, suffer from either mental illness or some form of addiction. It's not an easy person to deal with. And so what you have to do is not just kick that person around. You have to deal, as that young man just talked to, directly with the symptoms, but you need a place to put them to give them those wraparound services. So I'll let Jim take it from here. Hi. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I saw Anton, uh, and so Anton here um, formed a committee when we first uh, came into office and, and how, do we, how do we address homelessness in a different way that's being addressed because there were people working on this issue. We have shelters, but if you look around, it just wasn't enough. And it wasn't just a failing here. It's all across the United States, um, Sacramento, Seattle, Los Angeles, Portland, all throughout the United States, especially in areas where you can survive all year around on the streets. Now, up in the north, you know, maybe maybe not as easy, but, um, and the other thing is it's a very difficult problem, and I tell people that if it was easy, it would have been taken care of already and solved. Um, so Anton had a group of meetings. I was there, the police were there, the nonprofits were there, IHS, some homeless individuals, and we came up with the concept of CORE, you know, Anton's group did, and, um, and, and when we looked at these folks who needed this desperate help, there was a, a real high, um, it, it, we just saw the medical needs, the mental health needs, the substance abuse needs. And since our department was EMS, we were dealing with medical problems, um, it just felt like it should fit into our department. And our department is one that's um, used to providing medicine and care in the streets, under bridges, um, go to people's houses, uh, that's EMS. And so it, it, felt, it felt like it was the right place to be. Um, we started out a little over a year ago with just a, you know, an old ambulance with 300,000 miles on it that was kind of an EMS hand-me-down. We have four ambulances now. We have another four or five vehicles that are, again, just kind of hand-me-downs from the EMS fleet that were ready for, uh, for you know, city auction. And uh, we've got a team of 30-something people now. 
Uh, half of them are EMTs, emergency medical technicians, uh, two nurses um, with a psychiatric background and a, and a family doctor. And then the other half is community health workers, which have a social work background. And so this team now has been going out on the streets for a year engaging people and helping to get them off the streets into housing, into shelter, Honu, which is the city um, um, shelter. But what we were finding was is there weren't enough shelter spaces, especially for specialty care. And by specialty care, I mean folks who had bad wounds, amputations, had dementia, um, mental illness that were not well enough to go into a shelter, but not sick enough to go into the hospital. So uh, my question to the team was, what do we do with these folks? And the answer was nothing. They stay right on the sidewalk. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense at all, because these are the folks that we most need to get in, into shelter. And amongst a group of homeless, there's people who um, you know, want help, and probably, I'm guessing, 75 to 80% really want help and will take the help if we have somewhere to put them. The other 10 to 20%, I believe, are, are the criminal element hiding amongst the homeless, um, preying on the homeless, play, preying on businesses, on citizens. And so our hope is, is you know, once we can better get these folks placed who want help, it'll leave the criminals um, exposed and naked, and instead of the police having to look at 100 people, they may only have to look at 10 or 15 people and can engage them more directly. So um, uh, one, of the, one of the speakers talked about our respite. We have in the Evil A Resource Center now a 25-bed medical respite that's set to open in the next uh, probably two weeks or so. And that will take folks who um, are not, again, not sick enough for the hospitals, but um, too sick for the streets and the shelters. Our plan is to keep them there up to a month, up to three months if we have to, but get them placed. Nursing homes, foster care, uh, state nursing facilities like Malohia Hospital and Liahi Hospital, which have capacity, um, uh, or wrap housing with wraparound services, small house village, um, but we do not intend to discharge anybody back to the streets. Now we want that to be a flow, like a node. So once people come in, we get them placed, then we open it up for the next person. If we can move 20 to 25 people through there a month, that could be 300 people placed a year, and these are the hardest, hardest people to place who are homeless. If this is a success and we have funding, we should do one on West Oahu, maybe Pearl City or Central Oahu. Um, and as a mechanism, as a node, to just take somebody. And we're not gonna actually take them right off the streets there. We're gonna get them a medical screening exam, either at an ER or our own city clinic um, on Pawahi Street. They're gonna go to the Punawai rest stop and have a chance to take a shower and clean themselves. We're not gonna let them bring their clothes in from the streets that may have ukus or bed bugs. We're gonna give them all brand new clothing. And it's just gonna be a fresh start for them. We're teaming up with JABSOM, the medical school, to help provide some of the medical care. And we hope to partner also with the schools of social work and nursing at some of the other universities on Oahu. So it'll be a real team effort, a collaborative effort, but I think this is the model um, that is for the future and that will show the successes we can have on Oahu that we, other people can copy us. Um, CORE has been very successful in Chinatown. We've reduced the homeless there somewhere around 50%, maybe a little more. Um, but we realize those people, oh, well, some have gone into housing and shelter, Others have moved east and west. Um, and we realize there's homeless all over Oahu, and we know Kalihi's affected as well. Um, the encampment that somebody spoke of down here on Middle Street by the, along the canal, CORE spent a week there before um, the city um, DFM folks came in and cleared out the encampment. We offered them services, we offered them shelter, we engaged them. And so that's, we want to approach this with humanity and dignity, uh, but at the same time, we can't let people um, who are mentally ill and untreated or addicted to drugs, stay on the streets and hurt themselves and hurt others. So that's kind of what we're doing in a nutshell. It's a little long-winded, um, but um, but I, I hope um, to see you folks somewhere in a year and we can uh, brag a little yeah, more about and, our and, successes. And Jim, besides, uh, in case people are sitting there going, that's only 300 people a year. Tomorrow, since you alluded to our relationship with the governor, we're meeting tomorrow, several of us, on precisely what we've been talking about. I kind of was waiting for the governor to get through with legislation the legislative session. Um, but we need to put people places. 
as Jim is saying, so we could provide these wraparound services. As you probably learned during COVID, the city doesn't have a Department of Health. It's the State Department of Health, and they have resources. We have facilities, facilities we're actually looking at acquiring strategically for this purpose, in addition to some that we already have. So the idea here is to do precisely that. What wasn't working before was that notion of compassionate disruption. So let me give you an example of what that was looking like. And Chief, if I say something wrong, correct me. But last year, just last year, our, there, were, there was a roughly 1 million 911 calls. 1 million that our, our police officers responded to, the course of a year. 700 plus thousand of those were social work calls. So it, no, it takes nothing away from a quarter of a million calls involving crime, but there were social work calls. And oftentimes police would go there and an EMS would get dispatched there, and then they would get to the scene, see nothing was violent, the police would leave, the ambulance would pick it up, pick a person up, take them to Queens, they would get cleaned up in the emergency room, absorb emergency room services, maybe fed, maybe showered, and put back out on the street in a couple of hours. That was costing Queens Hospital over a half a billion dollars a year. It made the emergency rooms look like a war zone, uh, and it was ineffective. What we're doing is kind of a compilation, and Anton could talk about it, but we looked at, you know, what were the, who was it, where was it working well? And we looked at cities like Houston and Denver and Boston, and a lot of what this core program is about is a hybrid of the best practices out there, but we know this is the effective way to do it. And just the first year, Jim didn't mention it, in, in our startup, and we didn't even have all the vehicles, and we didn't even have all that staff, and by the way, we're trying to get to 50 people. But I think we treated well over 1,000 people, and we housed several hundred people, or something, something 100 people, what was the number, in our first year just beginning, and we've seen the effectiveness of that. So we need more places, we need more medical help from the state, from Japson, this is really an innovative program with our medical school, and we're gonna do this thing, and it's gonna make a big difference. And the biggest thing, though, is we're not letting up on the criminal element. We're not letting up. We're making a lot of arrests. We've put some really bad guys away. These guys won't talk about it, I'll tell you that. But we can't keep enough of them off the streets because of the way the system is, and that's something we're working through. We've got good cooperation with our prosecuting, prosecuting attorney and Steve Arm and his relationship with our police department and we're trying to get the judiciary to be more understanding of our concerns when people commit these felonies. So anyway, what do you want to hear? I'm just, I go back just to reinforce, we know that all of this, all of this weighs on public safety, okay? Question? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm gonna do a little background. You're That's Evelyn, okay. Evelyn, yes. right? I, yeah, thank yeah. you for the opportunity to speak tonight directly to you. This is a really rare occurrence. Uh, usually mayors of the past would screen out the people who are given a voice. So thank you for that opportunity. I kind of compare you to Fasi Fomea. I was little then, but I liked him. Yeah. Um, uh, again, I'm Evelyn Cullen. I'm going on uh, six generations at the same address in Kalihi below Nimitz. I'd like to ask you, how old do you think my home is? Six generations. Wow. I'll take a guess. 100 years old. Over. Yeah, it's really old. Wow. Um, do you know that I can't get a permit to renovate my home more than 10% a year? When my ancestors bought the land, it was residential. Over the years, it began to change. We didn't know or they didn't know how, to, how it would affect them or their future generations thinking forward. I like where I am. The city wants me out. I was there first. I'm staying, even if it means I continue to live in a termite-eaten house and raise the next six, six generations in it. City wants us out by not giving me a zoning variance or spot zoning. I went to the, all the TO, uh, Kali TOD meetings. I made sure my spot zoning was in the appendix of the plans, then suddenly it was gone. I went to council members, at the time it was Cochola and then Manahan and now Cordero. They did help me, but it still disappeared. Still I live in my term, my Eaton house. 
city says, because of the zoning, I have to leave eventually, and a warehouse will come up. How does the city know my story? They don't, but you do. You reside in a different zip code, but you, a Kalihi too, you're a Kalihi boy too, because you spent a lot of your um, waking hours in Kalihi, so I would consider you a Kalihi boy. I'll th I thank you for that. I realize things were so changing Evelyn, what now. is your question? Okay, so number one, I want that zoning because I want to rebuild and remain. I, you know, I don't know. I yeah, don't. I know. I already spoke to Dero about it. Okay. Okay, and then the next thing, I'm also on Neighborhood Board 15, and I got involved simply because of this. I missed you because I was dealing with some health issues, but I was there last night, and they told me about your wonderful presence. Um, let's see. Uh, Another thing, I work with Shopo in the community because I live on Hoy Street right in the middle of the block, so we do community cleanups. Um, DFM was involved. There's still dump sites on um, Mokawea and Kahai between um, Silva Street. And I see DFM come because um, the trailer, the boat trailer and the back end of a truck is now gone, but now there's a refrigerator there. Um, okay. So that's a DFM one. And then also for earlier, someone was talking about the speed bumps, and I understand that it goes between the state and the city depending on who owns the road. So I wanted to say that there's um, a lot of inconsistency in the design, and that could somehow cause problems when people are going over it. Like, I don't know. Just the design is- Some seem higher than the others? Yes. I, I don't know. Think that's possible, John? John says it's possible. Yeah, okay. And, um, so I so, live and reside. I'm a teacher here still. And, well, and I'm also the girl 35 years ago in a blue common gear on, on Puhale Road and Kahai Street. That was me. Oh, okay. That was you. <laughs> I spent a lot of years on Puhale Road. Yeah. yeah. But you're good. I voted for you. And I think you're doing an awesome job and, and your whole crew. I don't have a gripe with you guys. I mean... It's the state that I really, like the judiciary, they really uh, need to. Well, you know what, I, give you, I can give you Josh Green's cell number right now, <laughs> and you, you, we can get on with the stuff, okay? But, but you know, like sewer too, there's an easement that runs through my property. Can I get some discount off of the, the sewer charges? Because it's nuts. Okay, thank you, Evelyn. <laughs> Anton wants to say something to that. So, ma'am, this may not apply to you, but it made me think about it. I, I just want to let you know that we have home loan programs in the city where you can get a zero uh, interest loan. We amortize it over 20 years, and if you make your payments for 10, we forgive the last 10. So it's like a half off the loan. We also have uh, rehab loans. So come to the Department of Community Services website if that's something that, uh, that you need, and, and we'll work with you on that. Wow. I didn't, I didn't know that. Uh, that's a. <laughs> I had the wrong mortgage, man. I tell you. Okay, who's up? Okay, thank you, sir. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, Kevin Lai from Downtown Chinatown Neighborhood Board, and I serve as a secretary there. So many people here tonight. I really appreciate that you brought everyone together. Um, a shout out to Lloyd for the opportunities that Neighborhood Board provides, and I encourage everyone to get involved with your local neighborhood board. But Mr. Mayor, tonight, regarding that area that I serve, in the next couple of years, there'll be at least two hotels being either built up or converted. There have been a number of old office buildings converting to residential areas. Eventually, rail will reach our area. If we combine those additional people that will be out and about in the community, there's the impression that the city owns a number of properties that at street level could contain either commercial or retail space. And I wonder if there's anyone on your team that can comment on that, if that's true and accurate, and what plans might be being made to prepare for the additional people that will be around so we can have people with places to go, stores to shop, get the economy yeah. moving and, and vitalize the area. There's a lot of uh, empty retail space down there. We have a whole city block with Walmart's closing and the back half of that, which was scheduled to be housing, which may ultimately be that, kind of up in the air right now, and just so you know, that represents 3.3 .3 acres. The Walmart lot alone was 2.2, the other was 1.1, right in the middle of our urban core, plus other businesses that were closed and still not open. What we are trying to do is activate the place because we know, 
and it's true in all other major metropolitan areas. If people are living down there, a lot of the other element moves out. Kat, do you want to take a shot at that? So this is actually something that I'm, I'm kind of excited about. Um, so our department oversees the city land, and the city owns some properties in Chinatown and in downtown where there are commercial spaces, which have largely gone unprogrammed for several years. Some of them are even boarded up. So one thing that we're working on is rewriting our leasing laws so that we can get it back into the community, so that we can activate them, we can work with nonprofits, and we can be creative with how we activate the streetscape, whether it's through you know, cultural and arts facilities, whether it's through public bathrooms, whether it's through uh, other opportunities like that. So that's something that we're working on, at least for the city properties. And by the way, thank you for all the work you do. I know how invested you are in Chinatown in that whole area, and I appreciate it. Who's up? Otherwise, it's going to be back. Ah, here we go. Yes, sir. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Bruce Lum. I'm a little shorter than most. And uh, I wanted to come and ask you my specific question. You said not to read my glowing uh, thank yous to you for the time that you've been in office, but no, no, so thank we'll, you. we'll bypass all that. Um, my question is specific to, could you help me to meet with the right CNC persons to discuss what can be done to correct the loophole in Chapter 10 of the DPR's rules and regulations, specifically 101.7 C, 1, capital E. It has to do with the number two one on the signs that are all in, in all the parks that says it prohibits animals in all public parks except as um, change by rules that will be, can be promulgated by the director of parks and recreation to do otherwise. Okay. So she has the ultimate authority to do this. So what I need to, I want to know is, who are these people that I can talk to? Because I've spent almost all my retirement years trying to f solve this problem. You want, you want to take your dog to the park? Is that what it is? No. What do you want to do? I want people to respect the law of all Moana Park. OK, so you're talking about animals that are in the park, despite the fact we have a sign up that says you can't do that. Right. And OK. Laura, you want to? So good to have Laura Thielen with us, because <laughs> she's got this stuff down. Good. So, Bruce, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I've enjoyed working with you on the McCoy Courtyard um, renovations and really appreciate the group's involvement in that. Um, what we're trying, we, we get a lot of complaints about dogs coming into parks where they're not supposed to be or dogs being off leash in parks where they are allowed um, with leashes. So one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to locate um, some new areas where we can have established dog parks because there's a lot of residents that do have dogs and they need a place to take them. So uh, because of the repeat complaints about Ala Moana, the staff has recently looked over at Kaka'ako uh, Waterfront Regional Park and not on the Mauka areas, because we don't want the dogs on the fields where the kids are playing um, sports and games, but on the Makai area, uh, we're allowing dogs there on leash. And so the um, staff at Alamona Beach Park are gonna be able to educate people, but redirect them. Because we keep telling them that you're not allowed to come in here with dogs and they'll ignore it. We're hoping that by providing them an avenue to be able to go legally, that, that we would have a higher success rate. I'm not anticipating 100%, but if we could get closer. We also have a lot of um, dogs coming into Makiki District Park. So we're taking a look at uh, that area that's on Punahou, and um, there's like a, a little park there that's in the corner. And we do have an ability to put up fencing and to set up dog parks. Uh, we've done that one recently in Hoa Aloha, working with Councilwoman Cordero, and we're working with Councilwoman Kia Aina uh, for one in Kaneohe. So if people have ideas of places where we can put up dog parks, it's something that we can do in-house relatively easily with fencing. And I think it will, um, again, we, we're not anticipating 100% success, 
But if we could get you know, a 50% reduction, and then if people get in the habit of going to the place where it's legal, they're not going to come back to where it's illegal. So that was to set up my question. My question is, where, who are the people that I can talk to? I've talked to HPD. I've been on all the doors that pertain to this. And the big problem is this particular section of 10, 1.7 has this huge loophole. It's a contradiction to the law. It says that you, the director, can allow, and it's already being allowed, anyone with a dog who satisfies the provisions of this chapter that was above 1.7, the definitions and everything else, is allowed to come to the park before the park is open and even after the park is closed. So that includes 24 hours almost because you can walk in. You are allowed to traverse the park even to the shoreline. What isn't real clear to everybody, it's very chaotic, is that traverse means you can't stay. That implies you can't stay. You have to be moving through the park. But what we are having is a lot of people are taking great liberties and even unleashing their dogs. So right now, all of them on really looks like a sanctioned leash and off-leash dog park. But, so I'm not arguing with you. I'm not taking, the, what I'm pointing out is there is a glaring loophole in the law that's creating this big chaos and it's causing me a lot of risk. I've been assaulted twice by just saying to someone, what I usually say, I'm going to try and tell you in the most kindest way, and I stand far away from them because sometimes the dogs get excited, that you're not allowed to bring dogs to this park. It's prohibited by this sign, and so forth and so forth. It never works yeah. uh, for the ones who so, don't want to obey. So, okay, so Bruce, I think we've got it. You've got the contact with Laura. I can work with you on uh, looking at the statute. That. I'm sorry, yeah. I don't have that one subsection memorized, but I would be happy to uh, work with you, and we have contact information right. for each other. Okay. I'm sorry, I know, well, I know it sounds bad. That's petty, okay, I know we let yeah. it go a little bit, but I, <laughs> you know, you. I don't know how many people in here have animals or they're concerned the same way, and we want to let it go. You know, let me just say, as the other, this next gentleman comes up, not every one of these men and women will get a question tonight, but yet they're all here, and that's been true for the last two and a half months. And as you remember, I, maybe you remember I said at the outset tonight, this is a journey of learning for us. And we all agreed that as a team, we wanted to get familiar at a grassroots level across the island with the concerns in all the various districts, neighborhoods, et cetera. I hope that that's the same in reverse for you tonight as well. We're trying to give you the best of our information. I did say you may not like the answers, but we're trying to give you as much insight and I do, and I want to comment before you even ask the question, I do appreciate the diversity of questions we're getting up here tonight. So we want this to be highly informative. Sir. I'm not going to ask a question. I want to know what I can do for you, because I'm a retired city employee, Parks and Recreation, 35 years. And all I want to do is share my contact information with Laura Thielen on how we're going to cut down the risk management inside our city parks. I know there's tens and tens of millions of dollars out there. So What's I just want to contact with Laura Thielen. I know this because Augie Tubera came in Golden City and he goes, Coach Francis, you got to come help me. The lady went break her leg in Kapilani Park. My, my wife went, who? This is not a commercial. People get hurt in the parks. Yes, they do. So my point is, what I can do for the city. I'm a retired city employee, construction suit. Well, I'll push it, I'll push I just it. want to contact with, with Laura Thielen. Yep. And there's, there's just a few things I want to share with her because okay. I know they put her on the stand. I love the city. The Parks Department is for the kids. It's for the playing fields out there. It's for a keiki out there, in, even in the zoo. And lastly, my two cousins played for you when I was in seventh grade back in the 70s. Who are they? <laughs> Fred, 
Francis Kino and George Lindsay. Oh, that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I remember you George with your sailor yeah. hat Fred, out there. Let me Cook ask Field. a bizarre question. Is Francis still alive? Because, you know, George passed, and I know that. Um, he's yeah. retired. He's retired? Good. He's probably looks like the same, maybe 10 pounds lighter. Wow. But I okay. remember you out there with Larry Price. Yeah. Oh, and one more player, uh, Scott Bowler. Oh, Scott was great. Played at Damien High School. He's at the uh, Poly Golf Course. Yeah. We only talk turf. Okay. Really. So oh, well, when Laura has the time, she can come here and I yeah. can share my information. All right, thank, thank you. you. We'll get Laura and you together. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your willingness to help, by the way. We're not going to take that for granted or lightly. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and your staff. Some years ago, a girl was driving her car in Makiki with the windows rolled up, her speakers are loud. She was in an intersection and she got hit by a fire truck. There's a system now called Opticon. I like to know if that system is working. What the system allows emergency vehicles to get a green light when coming to an intersection. And Michael uh, Formby knows about that because I asked that question many years ago. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Is DTS, or is that, or the siren? Chief, you have any thoughts on that? You know, Chief Howe, you haven't had a question in the other. This will be good. It'll be good to hear that voice. Go ahead, you guys. So, All right, so you got the head of EMS in ocean safety and the, and the fire chief right here. So, so what he's talking about is um, there's a, a flashing light on most ambulances in our department, and um, it changes the light to green, the way, the way the ambulance is going, and all the other lights to red. And you can tell the intersections that have this because there's a little T hanging down from the light. But not all intersections have it, and the ones that, are, that do have it, you know, I'd have to talk to the expert here which are functional and which aren't. But um, it's a safety feature. It, you know, lets the ambulance and the fire emergency vehicles go through in the green. Um, we code them so you can't buy them over the internet and put them in your own car because, you know, we'd all love to have one of those, right? Um, but we do use them in the ambulances. Chief? Well, my first question ever in, in town. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, okay, well, and, yeah. Uh, and you can take as long as you want with your answer. Go ahead. Basically, I'm just going to mirror what, what Jim is saying. And um, whatever devices, I know we're in discussion with DTS. They're coming up with different types of technologies that can be also be used to control and moving away from Opticon and using the GPS and uh, locations of the vehicles as they traverse through these intersections. And um, it's one of the fiber optics, and I'll hand it off to DTS to, I guess it's an improvement over the Opticon systems. Now, and John, I'm going to challenge you for a concise answer. <laughs> so yes, we have a system called Opticon. Um, it is an older system that's been used for many years, not only here, but across the nation. We are, as Chief House says, we're looking at different technologies. Now, GPS is everywhere, right? So we're looking at ways that the GPS can actually control. All of our traffic lights are hooked up via um, broadband. And um, so we're looking at ways that the GPS can actually trigger lights to change when we have ambulance or police or fire or even transit buses. Okay, thank you, John. Yeah, you know, um, it, the question hasn't come up tonight, um, but one of the things I'm excited that's gonna develop that you can anticipate is uh, the installation of surveillance cameras in Chinatown. We've gotten a little bit of press on it. We have six have already arrived. We plan to install 52, which is more than double the existing 26 that were put there a long time ago, 21 of which don't work. But just in the spirit of public safety, one of the things that you can anticipate if it doesn't come up, just so you know, I think it's gonna be a great tool for our police department. Uh, it may even deter some crime. Um, but we're really determined to try to make it as safe as possible. Who's next? Yes, sir. Hi, good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my name is Tor Miyagi. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Um, I also want to ask about Loi Kalo Mini Park. Um, our neighborhood board vice chair asked about it. Our board member elect also talked about it. Um, Loi Kalo is one of the only working Loi Kalos in an urban area. It's an important green space. It also, unfortunately, still has too much gang activity and crime. And so the problem is, I think, that there's too many city agencies. It's a mismatch of people with responsibilities for the park. DFM manages a private road that goes to there. The park itself is owned by a board of water supply. 
Parks and Rec manages the parking Welcome lot. Welcome to my world. And so, who, who even thought all that up once upon a time? It's amazing. I, I don't know. But yeah. what, what do you think is the best venue for all of these different stakeholders to come together to figure out how to keep this park accessible and safe? Well, I'm going to go to Laura, who's the head of our parks. Do you have any thoughts on that? And, and we can follow. I mean, I hear what you're saying. So first of all, I uh, have been meaning to come out to the park. You guys do a wonderful job. I've heard fantastic things from the staff about the work that you've done to restore the area. Um, and I, really, I would like to get your contact information and follow up some more. Um, one of the things that the mayor has done really well with the cabinet is really building a team because he is a, a coach. Um, so we work very well with each other. And so it's something where, um, you know, we could sit down and talk about what the issues are. We can work with um, our department, with DFM, and with uh, Board of Water Supply. We can set up adopt-a-park agreements. We can set up interagency memorandum of agreements, you know, so that everybody could work together and, and we can identify if there is separate responsibilities or if it makes sense to shift them or not. Um, so we'd be happy to sit down and maybe, you know, our department and you could start the conversation and then we can bring in Board of Water Supply and DFM when appropriate, if that would work for you. Thank you so much. And as long as HPD, we could invite them as well. A lot of the frontline officers, when they come, they don't even know whose property it is. So they say that they can't help us when there's things, when it's on Board of Water land or Parks land. So if we could yeah. bring them in. I used to work at uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources. And so you'd have a single area and part of it would be in one division, part of it in another. And it was always very difficult to do enforcement there. So yeah, we appreciate that. Thank you so much. Looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you. Th thank you. You know, this team and, and others, because there's some deputies here tonight taking turns with directors and vice versa, but all of them, directors and deputy directors, in our first couple of years in office, and will be coming up again for a third time, have all walked Chinatown together. And it was fascinating for me, because I was a rookie mayor at the time, trying to understand how the city worked in these various departments. And, and the need, as Laura, and thank you for that acknowledgement, said you can't operate the city in silos. They have to collaborate, have to work together, because we would come upon something as simple maybe as a broken curb, or looking at a tree that was dead or empty. And what it would take to fix that, to remedy that, was four or five departments. <laughs> Not just one of them could own it. It was pr pretty interesting. So what you just brought up doesn't surprise me. Uh, and we're, gonna, we're trying to cut through a lot of that stuff. So I see he's talking to Nate right there, who's our PIO for Department of Parks and Recreation. Who's that? Rick Kamada, are you going to sit there all night without asking a question? Because I, you know, I didn't do the radio show, but I heard that Roger and John did a great job of the radio. She's up behind you. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to cut over here. I wasn't going to speak, but I was just going to kind of listen. But I'm this Melissa Afomalga. Hello, Melissa. I'm from, hello, from St. Francis. And so I was actually more interested. There's a couple of things. One is for DPP. You know, we've had some challenges, our share of challenges um, with getting our permits. We were one of those that were stuck in the bot when there were bot issues. And so our permits got renewed. And yeah. so there's a population that we're unable to service because of some of the permits that we're awaiting. And most of it has to do with remediation work um, due to water intrusion. Um, because of those type of modifications that we had to make to our current permits, we had to um, redo some of our permit requests. And so I'm just wondering from DPP, sorry, Gerald, um, needing to ask the question about where we are in the process. I know that there has been a lot of staffing transition issues and we get that um, and we want to be a good community partner, but wanting to see where in the permit process, not only us, but we know of other um, organizations and you know, like homeowners as well, are um, waiting in line to be able to get their permits processed. Okay, thank you for that question. We, we're, we are working on improving the pre-screening process. Uh, when we launched it the uh, latter part of uh, uh, last year, uh, it was pretty cumbersome, and uh, even for us. So we are, we are improving it uh, as we speak. Our, our director, in fact, goes down there almost every other morning herself to try and uh, understand the manual part of it, it, it you know, it's a auto, uh, artificial intelligence technology, right, to actually make it easier. So we've kind of adjusted the sensitivity on that part so it doesn't pick up every little scratch and 
a straight line on a set of plans. So um, I think it's, we've improved it a lot uh, since that uh, initial launch. So we are making a, a, a major strides in that. What I can do is uh, take your contact information and we can track down the permits for St. Francis. Uh, I can tell you though that on the residential side, which is over 85% of our permits, we've gotten it down from 298 days to, to issue a permit to uh, an average of about 168. And actually the majority of that is even less than that uh, 168 day turnaround. So on the commercial side, we're still making some major efforts there, but we're, we're making improvements. Yeah, I think we're making more than improvements, but go ahead. I can, I can totally appreciate that because we've been checking every day. So we, we've seen some movements on some things that we've had in place. Um, so we really appreciate, you know, we, we do a lot of work with the community services. So um, we, uh, one of the populations that has been struggling to be able to get service is our memory care unit. And so that's why, um, you know, we're trying to figure out what we can do because we have been, a lot of people have been calling us. And so a lot of it is not attributed to us per se. It's more about just waiting for the permit so we can do some of the tie-in work and some of the remediation work. So that's why I asked the question. So, but again, you know, totally appreciate this venue um, to be able to come out and speak to you, uh, Mayor, and the rest of the team. So we do do a lot of work. The other question I had, and if, I'm sorry if um, I'm gonna cut real fast, but for Board of Water Supply, um, we know that there are some programs that were in place, and I know a couple, a few years ago, and this was all pre-COVID, where we were talking about being able to help support our kupuna by doing um, some, and I'm sorry, I can't remember her name, but she came to the board of, um, she came to the neighborhood board when we were at Ma'e Ma'e. And uh, we were talking about being able to support our kupuna for like low flow showers, being able to help install those kind of things. And I'm wondering if the program still exists to be able to support that because, um, you know, things are expensive for our kupuna. They're on a fixed income. We want to be able to support them. And I'm, so I just am wondering if that program is still available um, to be able to support our kupuna. Uh, yeah, we had a program where we would go into like public housing uh, where there's a lot of kupuna living there and actually do the retrofits ourselves. Because of COVID, I put a stop of that, uh, to that unless the units were actually vacant. Uh, but we're looking to start that up again. Okay. And we're working, actually I'm working with the executive director for Hawaii Public Housing. Uh, we're gonna look at a program for maybe uh, uh, improving water conservation at Kamehameha Homes. Uh, to just work with HPHA to see that as a pilot and try to expand that with them. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Mahalo. Wes, come on, but before you, just one second. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, during the State of City that maybe some of you saw, some of you didn't. We talked about the wicked problems facing Honolulu. And we address, that's what we've agreed to as a team to take this stuff head on you know, with respect to housing and the crisis that we have, you know, with respect to homelessness, with respect to public safety, with respect to the rail. But I can tell you, nobody up here has a perfect department, but if there's one department we, ha we know we have to fix, it's DPP, and it's been broken for decades. And every time we get into one of these sessions, I hurt for somebody when I understand the urgency and the real need to have this be much more efficient. We are gonna get there. We have broken it down. I like to tell people sometimes you strip away all the fanfare for all of us, not just me being mayor, and the roles we have and everything else. At the end of the day, running the city is about problem solving. It's about understanding that problem, trying to develop a solution, and then executing. The myriad of problems inside a DPP, which have been years in the making, actually probably since 1998 especially, in the last 25 years, when. Jeremy Harris combined three different departments to create this sort of one-stop center. Um, and I'm not blaming Mayor Harris, but it hasn't worked and it's gotten progressively worse. And then you add to that the fact that the ordinances have become very complicated with the codes. You add to that the manpower shortages we have. You add to that the fact that the city, and I'm saying this is gonna sound harsh, but I'm not gonna single out any one mayor, totally underinvested in technology, the kind of technology that we could be using to make us a lot more efficient. We've since stepped up to the plate to do that. We have real manpower shortages there. We have expertise shortages there. 
You just can't get people out there overnight, but we're doing our very best. And we've actually developed some things. We're doing some stuff with technology that's never been done before. Last year, in 2022, DPP received over 17,000 permits, 17,500, and processed about almost 14,000. That's the same number of permits they did 25 years ago. The difference was the construction value of those permits 25 years ago in 98 was about 785 million. The construction value of the permits last year was 2.4 billion. So we talk about economic recovery and we talk about DPP and knowing and understanding what that means. We could not take it any more seriously. Half of the permits that we receive of the 17,400 in Jero, if I say something wrong, feel free to correct me, come from the solar industry, 60%. We are right on the threshold of solving a lot with that. Right on the threshold, using technology, and working with the solar industry, we've done a lot of outreach with business industry association, all kinds of people, developers, everything. So we're aiming to, as Jiro just said, 168 days down from 298. That's not acceptable for us. Not that I don't appreciate that. But we're a long way from feeling like it's there. But I will tell you, we are so far in the right direction from where we were when we started two and a half years ago. And it's going to come. In some cases, it's going to come really fast. And I can tell you, it will be a very joyous day for everybody because we recognize, that's why I bring up the construction value. You know, whether you're trying to build a building or get your bathroom remodeled, you know, it's really, really important. And we know that. And we're operating with as much urgency on this matter as we possibly can. I, that's the best I can say. All right, next question. Wes, sorry, thank you for that chat. I just want to shed a little perspective, though. We're not indifferent to the challenges, not at all. No, I thank you for that. And by the way, Melissa, if uh, um, Gerald is going to be at our neighborhood board meeting in July, so if he doesn't know anything, he can come and see oh, us. You got it. So Gerald, he's going to be there with us. I don't know if I should ask this question, but I was debating, but I thought since we got all the key players. But you're Wes Fung, so go ahead. I know. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I thought I'd do it anyway. Uh, more of a global question. Yeah. First of all, more of a happy note in the two questions. The happy note is that I've also, my friends, so, or maybe, uh, do you think I'll still be alive before the rail gets going? And you, I, well, I'm happy to you, say if that. You could stay alive between now and June 30th, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Just my two questions real quick. I put on my hat now, not as a chair of the neighborhood board, but now as an adjunct professor teaching at the university. A lot of my students live out down there in Kapolei. The question they have is, will the rail ever get to the University of Hawaii? First question. Number two, will the rail be self-sustaining? And if the answer is no, where are we going to get the money? Will my property taxes, my GET go up, and how much? Well, for you, I think we're going to double your taxes just for asking the question. <laughs> You know, uh, look, as far as the University of Hawaii, what we've done in, in coming to terms with the FTA after inheriting just a couple of years ago a very dysfunctional situation with the rail. In fact, the FTA had pulled out as a construction partner, had not given any of the money back to the city since 2017, was withholding $744 million. And thanks to Lori Kai Keener, her leadership, and what we've been able to do... What we've been able to do in working together as a team with city council, with the heart board, is really get our act together in a way that I, I can tell you the FTA was really surprised. So I'll just answer this for you, Lord, but you can come up and talk about the future of it if you want. Someday I hope it will, because if you remember when it was voted on in 2005 by referendum at a number that was projected to be much lower than the $10 billion we'll ultimately spend, it was supposed to go to the University of Hawaii. And even though they were out building it in Kapolei, the first concession they made back in 2012 was that they changed the terminus from UH to Almona Center. Peter Carlisle signed that. Okay? And that became a 20-mile run from where it starts right now in East Kapolei, which is not a good place. I mean, it's next to Ho'opili, but it's in the middle of nowhere other than that. It should go the next phase deep into Kapolei. Anyway, because of the population. I think that someday it's going to go beyond my lifetime. I'll be with Frank Fossey somewhere since the lady brought it up. 
because I just want to be realistic. But we're going to get phase one done. And it'll be done by the end of this decade, hopefully, or maybe shortly thereafter. I'm not trying to push it, though. It's going to go beyond my time in office anyway. But we're going to start this first phase, which is going to be 18. We're going to start running it from Kapolei through to Aloha Stadium come June 30th. Um, that's, and then ultimately to Halekawila. That's 18.75 miles of the original 20 miles, or the re amended 20 miles. There'll be a second phase, and maybe we'll even begin planning it while I'm in office, you know? And we'll see. And I don't know what that second phase will look like, but I would think most certainly at a minimum to Almoana Center and at least four stops the other way in Kapolei, through Kamakana Ali'i all the way back down, because if you go out there and drive and you look at the housing, that's where it's going. So right now we're about to start, and we estimate we're going to be doing about 10,000 people a day going to a low stadium, and that gets us to the first employment center, which is Pearl Harbor. In two years' time, we'll be at Middle Street, which gets us by the second, the second employment center, which will be the airport, and by that time, we think daily ridership will come up to 25,000. We think by the time we get to Halekawila South Street, and I think these are low numbers, because I think the rail is going to surprise a lot of people. Look at the efficiency right now. You can go from East Kapolei to Aloha Stadium in 21 minutes. You cannot drive that in 21 minutes in the morning, and there'll be a bus waiting for you to get off. The efficiency and the effectiveness of this rail system is going to blow people away because it's about something they don't know anything about because they've never experienced it before. But it will manifest that way. So when we get to Halekawila and South Street, we estimate at that time it'll be 85,000. Now, public transportation is always subsidized in the city at some level. We've put money aside because there's going to be a handover from Hart to DTS operated and run it, just like we do our bus system, which is subsidized. I would tell you, on our plate, we're not looking at raising GET or any other taxes. It's one of the things we do with the OTAT to create some really tourist money, if you will. Uh, to help with that. But at some point, transportation, every municipality in major cities, of which we are one, is subsidized somewhat. So don't look at to, to be a profit center, even at 85 or maybe even 100,000 people a day. But it will be a very efficient. And the fact, I give Lori a lot of credit, and John Roger Morton's not here, and John Noucci, you know, but the fact that you could be able to ride on the, bu the rail the same as the bus is also going to work very well. So anyway, is there anything, Laura, you want to add? Because far be it for me to take any thunder away from you. But I just want you to tell as best anybody can predict, you know? Look, I'm, I'm a guy who learned a long time ago. There's a wonderful old Hebrew saying, men plan and God laughs. Um, and so, but I can tell you, as best we can lay it out, that's what I just laid out. Go ahead, Laurie. Um, the only reason I want to say something is I've got, been gone to 10 town hall meetings now, and rarely does heart come up. So I want to take a chance to at least say something at one of these meetings, but I'm so, so proud that I don't have to actually. Mayor has, he knows so much about this project. We keep him very much informed, so I'm proud of the fact that he could answer for me, but we're gonna get to University of Hawaii. I would love to get to the windward side. A majority of our funding is coming from the GETTAT, which expires 2030. So we have to have some work working with the legislatures to possibly extend it. I haven't approached them yet, and there's a reason for that. Um, Hart's reputation hasn't been good over the last few years. So we need to prove to the public, we need to prove to the legislatures, and once we open, once they get on that train, they will see how beautiful it is. Mayor talks a lot about the, the view. It is spectacular. and. You know, hopefully DTS, as they have that bus integration, it'll be very efficient. People will see it. And then what's happened all across the nation, when are you coming to my neighborhood? So once we get there, then maybe I can possibly ask them for the GET, TAT to be extended and we will get to UH. We have to connect the, the four campuses. When we're meeting early on with the mayor, I actually was going to move the station at HCC to Commandment Schools because um, I'm a true engineer and it was cheaper, more efficient to move it to that property. And in that meeting, Mayor calls President Lasner and says, Laurie, you need to stop being an engineer and stop thinking so black and white. Understand what we're trying to do. We need to connect the four campuses. So right there on that call, President Lasner said, no way, Laurie, you need to keep it at, at HCCs. But you guys can see, you can see what the traffic is like when the university is out. It's, it's wonderful, right? <laughs> so we do have to connect the four campuses so we will get there. We will get there, absolutely. 
Yes, absolutely. That's my dad says that to me too. When can I get in that train? I want to get in that train. I'm like, just hold on, just hold on, Dad. One more month. <laughs> yeah, we'll get you up. Thanks, thanks. Hey, we've got about 10 minutes left, and I did promise tonight earlier that if any of our elected officials were to come, I would introduce them. And now they're in the doorway. I just saw her stick her head in is Councilwoman Radiant Cordero, who's also our budget chair. Radiant, good to see you. Good to see you. You know, I'm going to digress for one second, and we'll get right to your question, sir. Um, I spent a lot of years in media, about 43 years. And um, in that context, we did a lot of research, a lot of, a lot of market research. We're in the news business, and Scott and I worked together, Hawaii News Now, same with Ian. Um, and one of the things we learned from the researchers, and I don't know if there's anybody in here, but the researchers will tell you, because we're always testing our market, always trying to understand. But they'll tell you that you can't test stuff that people don't know. It, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't come out. And so the point there is that I'm going to be really interesting to do really valid research on the rail once we become operational when you have that context. Because other than that, it's just pure spec. They don't know. And that's been one of the things. Understandably, there's been time delays, wasted money, and all the other inefficiencies that have happened that caused a lot of anger, believe me. I learned that during the campaign because my life was nothing but endless Zoom calls, five a day, and on everybody's hit list on every Zoom call was a lot of complaints about the rail. And I feel really proud that in two and a half years, despite the pandemic, we've shifted the conversation to from stop the damn thing to give us more, and nobody's even ridden it yet. So I'm expecting a lot of good stuff to happen here for our community in this island. Sir. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Is it possible to separate the water bill from the sewer bill? Thank Whoa, you. Whoa, great question. Is it possible? Very well. We only have eight minutes left, Ernie. <laughs> uh, maybe Mike should come up here with me, but uh, uh, Cruz Vina, Cruz, nice to see you, and thank you for that question. Uh, <clears throat> That's in my wish list. Uh, but yeah, the, you know, right now we have the water bill, which is sent out by the Honolulu Board of Water Supply in our envelope. Uh, we're doing a service uh, to the Department of Environmental Services to also include the sewer bill. So when you open your water bill, most of you will have both components. Just remember the water portion of that bill is from Board of Water Supply and the sewer portion is actually from E and V. Uh, we collect on the whole bill. Uh, but, you know, we should uh, maybe uh, continue, Mayor, if we could talk about uh, perhaps uh, separating the bill because uh, people get confused. Uh, they think of the water bill as water and sewer, and uh, um, that's, all I think, all I should safely say. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Cruz, for all that right. question. Thank you. Mahalo. <laughs> thank you, Ernie. Ken, right? Hey, Mr. Mayor. Hey, good to see you again, Ken. Good to see you again, too. So I have several questions. So the first question is, uh, it's more because we're talking about this road over here, right? So can we make or work with the, the state for a four-way uh, kind of crossing during school hours? The reason being is because you have about 2,300 students, maybe about 1,000 to 1,500 when school gets out, trying to cross from there yeah. right up above here. So um, Warren, you just take note of that. I mean, because he's asking if before we cross this DFM, right? Or who would that be, DTS? Yeah, be DTS. Be DTS? Okay. So I know that we, we have to work with the state, you know, because it is a part of the state and county, but is that possible? Is that something you guys would want to work on? Yeah, we can definitely take that to the state. Um, again, they have ultimate jurisdiction over this roadway, and that's kind of a secret that even a lot of people, I mean, you know, I think you're an average citizen. I don't, when they, when they ask us about roads, I, I don't want to make a big deal, but it is a state road, but we can carry that knowledge and take it to our friend Ed Sniffin at State DOT and see if we can get something done. He is our friend. He is a good guy. Yeah. And I will tell you this. I'm going to remind the governor again tomorrow because I said it election night up on the stage right after he got elected. We've promised unprecedented, unprecedented collaboration between the state and city. So I think that's very much on the table because Ed's a really good guy. Good times okay. in the transportation kingdom. Yeah, I think so. Appreciate it. Um, and the next one is um, because... Uh, I know that the A is changing in terms of the routes. I just found that out yesterday. Um, we're only going to have the one, and I know I've sent letters before about maybe we should make the one or the A, well, in this case the A is changing, 
uh, a 24-hour route, especially for King Street because that's the trunk line that goes through. So is that something that you would consider uh, and the 1L because if we're going to lose an area, which we will under that, that uh, Route A, that the 1L at least stop at the different schools. So like Iolani, Farrington, um, that is something I think would you be willing to consider? Absolutely. So um, with those changes that are coming up, you know, we have the opportunity. We generally change our bus services once a quarter, um, and that's our opportunity to, to change. In this case, we have rail starting June 30th. Again, I just wanted to kind of put that out there as a, as a reminder, rail starting June 30th. All of the bus services that change with that will go into effect July 1st. Now, normally, we change our bus services again in the third week of August, and that happens just because it coincides with UH's calendar. So if we find something that's not working or we could optimize and work it better along that North King Street corridor for Kalihi, then I think we're going to take that opportunity in that short run-up to the third week in August and make those changes. So um, we can definitely consider that. As for a 24-hour service, I think there is some smart uh, look at we can do with the Kalihi service in general. I know I've, I've personally handled your request about trying to shift some of the focus from two on School Street to North King Street, and I think maybe there's something we can do with that. Okay, yeah. I appreciate it. Um, and just one other thing too, um, this is more for the mayor. Um, you know, uh, 13, which is their uh, Chinatown neighborhood board, their Nurses neighborhood board over here, came up with what's called a special cooperative zone trying to get back to that footing again, but we'd love to have a chance to talk with you and, and see how we can have a collaborative effort, especially dealing with uh, Evil A. Um, there is no imaginary line between Chinatown and over here, and, and there will be crisscross, so uh, we'd love to have that. We're open to anything. If it makes it better, we're open to it. Right. Thank you for all you guys do. All Sorry. right, thank you. We've got time for one or two more questions. Does anybody? Well, if not, since we're, okay, Kenny. From the Sierra Club, the Outdoor Circle. What is it? One of those things. Randy Ching, Sierra Club. I yeah. want to Randy talk about bicycles real quick. Okay. So I'm with a group that's working to connect South Shore Path from Diamond Head to the the um, Railway Society in uh, Waipahu, Eva. Yeah, sorry, Eva. So that's where the end of the Leeward Bikeway is. So I want to ask either. DTS or resiliency office, how can we work with the city to connect all the different bike paths? Because all the paths are there. All we need to do is connect them. So how do we do that so we can encourage more bicycles, especially e-bikes? Okay. Because e-bikes are the future, 100%. Yep. Yep. And we need to have more biking, 365 days a year bicycling, bicycling environment, best place in the world, and we don't even have a bike path that goes from Diamond Head okay. to the railway station, I, railway I, society. So John, Matt, you want to take a shot at this as we close out the evening? You're going to give the floor to John? Go ahead, John, 30 seconds, baby. You'll be very happy to find out that we have some money that we received from our Washington, D.C. senators and Congress mem members that we want to do a 30-mile South Shore bikeway, similar to what you have proposed. And what that does is exactly as you said, it links all the assets we have. And actually, we want to run it from Nanakuli all the way using all the assets we have. We're going to actually, just for this neighborhood, we're going to be putting better cycling infrastructure on North King right through the heart of Kalihi because we recognize how many people cycle through here. But again, taking all those assets, putting in some new assets, connecting it Nanakuli all the way to UH Manoa and Waikiki. So that is on our goal to do the planning study and do preliminary engineering on that. There's a lot of work to be done. Pearl, the Pearl Harbor Historic Trail is a big piece that we're going to have to coordinate with our Navy partners. Um, working on that connection, I'm sure you're thinking about at the Admiral's Boathouse. So I, I was part of a group that was working on the Leeward Bikeway. And we finally got state DTS after 30 some odd years to build phase one. That only goes to the Hawaii Railway Society. It was supposed to go all the way to Nanakuli, Lua Lua Lane, Naval Depot Road. But the state told us, oh, all the money is not we used for phase one. So it, back 30 years ago, it was enough for phase one or phase two. But now we only can get to phase one. So 
it, the leeward bikeway is going to end there. It's not going to go up to Nanakuli like it was originally planned in the mid 90s. Well, I will tell you this. So I just said in my last response that it's good times in the transportation kingdom, which might be a weird thing to say. But we are fully backed by state DOT. They're our partner on this. And you know, in fact, we barely, we haven't even gotten the money to do this planning and engineering yet. And state DOT went out for a grant to see if they could build it. So that's the kind of lockstep coordination we have with our partner agencies that we're actually looking at this together. And not that we expect people to ride from Nanakuli to Waikiki, but this is like a, uh, would be like a bike highway that lets you ride comfortably from say Waipahu to Kapolei, which is reasonably, some people gonna ride 30 miles, but not everybody will. But that's the kind of vision that we're looking at and in coordination with our state DOT partners. Good to hear that, good to hear that, but I still gotta see it because we work yeah. with Ed Sniffin at state D when he was highways, not the big thing, but just highways. And he wanted to help us, but we felt very constrained because there were certain things he couldn't do. He's we've the head honcho now. We've unleashed Stiffen, okay? Yeah. He's no longer constrained. Yeah, All right. <laughs> I thank you. I thank you. Thank you, John. This has been your night tonight up here, John. Stick around. Hey, I'll, I'll be, on behalf of our entire team, thank you. You've been a wonderful audience tonight, and I appreciate everything, and God bless.